at 257 to 299 dollars per uh, kilowatt. For a coal fire plant, 260 to 302. And for an oil fire plant, 187 to 224. The indirect cost, 154 to 173 for the reactor, 126 to 142 for coal, 93 to 108 for oil. Uh, the total cost then for the um, plant would be 411 to 472 dollars per kilowatt electric for the nuclear, 386 to 444 for coal, and 280 to 332 for oil. Now this, of course, is just a capital cost. The major advantage of uh, reactors has been in the uh, relatively low cost of uh, the fuel. And of course, in the final result, uh, this is uh, precisely what we would expect to see. And there's the justification for building uh, reactors in the first place. In this illustration, uh, we have uh, the cost component, capital, fuel, O and M for the uh, light water reactor, we find that the total cost, this is the estimated generation cost now, is 16.20 mils per kilowatt hour. For coal, it's 18 mils per kilowatt hour. And for oil, 33.4. Now this is, uh, these figures were collected, I presume uh, fairly recently, but uh, probably don't reflect the recent uh, increase in the price of oil. We see there the reason why nuclear plants are in fact built that uh, the cost per uh, kilowatt hour is less for uh, nuclear plants than it is for the other plants. Now, let me emphasize once again, as I noted before, that uh, we need all of the energy sources, and uh, uh, really what I'm attempting to show here is that uh, from an economic point of view, it certainly makes sense making use of nuclear reactors. Now, shown here is the makeup of uh, the fuel generation cost. And I think it's important to note that uh, spent fuel shipping is included in this list, and uh, so is waste management. So that uh, the uh, total charge for uh, the fuel, two and a half mils per kilowatt hour, does include these uh, charges for, for uh, looking after the fuel. That is, uh, the transportation of the fuel and also for its eventual storage. Now, there are certain sensitivity factors that uh, can be brought into this. Uh, there's a base estimate for the light water reactor, which is shown on an earlier illustration, was 15.2 mils per kilowatt hour. And we can see what effect uh, reducing the plant utilization from 80% to 70% would have on it. It obviously increases the cost to 16.9. Increased plant capital cost by 10% would bring uh, the increase uh, over the base cost to 16.4. And if the fuel cost were to increase by 50%, 50%, it would increase the cost to 16.5 mils per kilowatt hour. Uh, similar sensitivity uh, considerations for coal uh, indicate that if the uh, fuel cost is reduced by some 13, 30%, the cost of uh, energy from coal would be 16.3 mils per kilowatt hour. And uh, similarly for oil, if the reduced fuel cost where as much as 30%, the cost would be 26 mils per kilowatt hour. So it does indicate the range of costs that uh, we need to consider. Now, there are, there are other things that need to be uh, considered in connection with uh, um, the use of power plants. And one of these um, is how we use land. And uh, the amount of uh, land that is actually used for fossil fire plants and the nuclear plants uh, is indicated. <coughs> Excuse me. Is indicated here. Uh, we'll go directly to the total. For a coal-fired plant, uh, we would need uh, uh, 25,300 acres. We're talking here. considerable land advantage over the coal stations. Now it's clear that uh, in considering coal, uh, that one of the largest uh, components, well the largest components that comes from uh, the mining, 
where uh, land disturbance is taken into account. Another uh, area of uh, concern is um, what are the occupational hazards associated with, uh, say, operating the ver various kinds of plants. And um, we have here the occupational fatalities due to accidents, and uh, these come from uh, 1965 to 70 injury rate production data. And uh, we have a comparison once again between uh, uh, fossil stations and uh, nuclear stations, and we have the totals at the bottom for, uh, we're talking about a thousand megawatt electric plant year once again, and we find that uh, coal and uh, uh, the, the figures are 1.1 for oil, 0.16, and for gas, 0.07, and we find that uh, the nuclear experience is certainly uh, consistent with the oil and gas, and is about one-tenth that of the coal-fired stations. And uh, similarly, we find uh, uh, reasonably attractive figures for the nuclear industry, which I think we all know to be uh, such a highly regulated and uh, relatively safe activity that uh, I suppose one might argue that people ought to be fighting to get into it. Now, uh, the time is fleeting, and uh, I think I'd uh, best uh, point out that the same thing uh, same kind of information is available if one uh, considers the occupational health risks. The uh, <coughs> the, uh, the nuclear plants are still uh, uh, very favorable. Now, we do have a problem, and uh, one of the problems which uh, confronts us today is uh, the uh, projected growth. and. Uh, on this uh, next illustration, uh, we do see some uh, projected growth figures, and I'd like to draw your attention uh, principally to the uh, tons of uh, U308 that is to be required. At the present time, we're using burner-type reactors as opposed to breeders, and uh, it will take uh, a fair amount of uh, U308 to, uh, to satisfy this demand. This is uh, uranium that will have to be mined and made available uh, to the industry. Now, if we assume that uh, the use of reactors will grow as uh, has been predicted, then we see some uh, figures for the total accumulated tonnage of uh, U308 that will be required by the end of the century. And we see that it'll take two and a half million for uh, the domestic uh, needs and um, slightly more than that uh, for um, foreign uh, reactor usage. That is, reactors that uh, have been sold uh, by companies operating in the United States for use elsewhere. Now, this uh, illustration uh, provides uh, somewhat similar data, except that uh, various cases have been considered. I won't go into detail about them, except to note that uh, the cumulative figures uh, for uh, 1985 in thousands of tons of U308 uh, 450 for one particular case, and the most extreme case uh, indicates uh, a need of something like uh, uh, 700,000 tons of U308. And uh, on the lower illustration, we see the domestic resources of uh, U308, and uh, it's divided into reasonably assured or proved reserves and into potential reserves. And uh, it will be noted once again that uh, there is a, a potential problem that uh, faces us in terms of the availability of U-308. Uh, what is really said by these figures is that uh, a program for the exploration for uh, reserves of uranium is uh, crucially needed at this time. Uh, as we saw before, the effect of the cost of fuel on uh, the overall cost of energy produced by uh, nuclear energy is relatively insensitive to the cost of the fuel. Uh, this means, then, that there will be uh, uh, a temptation to, uh, to go to uh, low concentration ores, and uh, it's possible even to go to such a point that uh, the amount of land disturbance in terms of mining will be uh, very similar to that that uh, we usually associate with the mining of coal, so that there will be a, a tremendous environmental impact if we are forced to go to... Uh, to uh, ores that have really uh, comparatively low, low amount of uranium present. 
Now, all of this, of course, uh, speaks to uh, our need to look at, uh, at uh, breeder reactors. And uh, we, we know that, uh, well, perhaps we don't know, but uh, we're already uh, something like 20 years late in the development of a breeder reactor to avoid a bit of a crunch in the uh, development of our um, mining facilities. Now, the um, Cornell workshop, uh, which uh, did consider, consider the uh, energy in the future problem, uh, their report indicates that, uh, that the most vulnerable part of the nuclear enterprise is the uncertainty in the availability of uranium. And they note that the required increase during the next 12 years is fivefold. The, the whole question of uh, when a breeder is required is clouded by considerations of uh, the advanced converters. For example, the high temperature gas reactor, the uh, um, light water breeder reactor, and the heavy water reactor. The present generation of converters, the things that we're using now, can be used no later than the mid-1990s if the anticipated nuclear growth is to be realized. In view of the uncertainties in the evolution of the breeder program, it's, it seems impossible to speculate on the cost of uh, uh, at least in the cost of energy from the breeders, at least for the purposes of this meeting. Now, the remaining nuclear energy source uh, is fusion, which, as I think you're all aware, has yet to be demonstrated. Recent uh, Atomic Energy Commission predictions suggest that fusion may be demonstrated by the end of the century. It's always a little bit distressing to find may be demonstrated uh, appearing together. Now, engineering studies, of course, uh, should be carried out at this stage in the development of fusion, and in fact, of course, are. But I can't help but feel that many of the designers of fusion reactors must feel a little bit frustrated when they're carrying out their designs, when they realize that the very hinge pin upon which they, the process depends is still missing. At present, four fusion reactor uh, systems are being considered, the tokamak fusion reactor, the theta pinch device, the mirror reactor, and the uh, laser pellet scheme. Uh, the first uh, three reactors employ magnetic confinement, and the designs indicate outputs ranging from 200 megawatts electrical for the mirror machines to up to something like 2,000 megawatts electrical for the tokamak type. The laser pellet machines are probably going to be fairly uh, low output machines, something like 200 megawatts thermal, but obviously they could be clustered to, to provide a more convenient output. The University of Wisconsin studies on uh, their uh, version of the tokamak, uh, I'm not exactly sure how they pronounce it, it's UWMAK anyway, provide some interesting indications of fusion reactor problems. The radiation incident on the first wall will induce embrittlement requiring that the wall be changed every two years. That is, something like uh, 240,000 kilograms of steel per year will have to be removed and looked after. The radioactive stainless steel corrosion products accumulate at the rate of something like uh, 2,500 kilograms per year and must be removed to avoid maintenance problems. Following some 10 years of operation, this kind of a reactor, uh, the afterheat is about 32 megawatts thermal and the radioactivity is 1.6 times 10 to the 9th curies. And uh, this, of course, will decay, reaching something like a kilowatt thermal and 10 to the 3rd curies after about 100 years. And the cost of such large reactors, at least the tokamak type, is estimated to be something like 1.5 times 10 to the 9th dollars, or $1.5 billion. Now, the pellet scheme uh, obviously involves the use of uh, a large number of lasers, which, of course, must be synchronized. Um, I simply have no idea of what uh, the pellet machines uh, would cost. Once again, uh, they have not uh, yet demonstrated, at least not to my knowledge, uh, um, the process. So in concluding, I would say that uh, I see that, uh, that uh, we do need energy from all of the sources that uh, have been touched upon today and others that we haven't had time to discuss. It, it does appear that from an economic point of view that uh, energy from the nucleus, at least from uh, fission reactors, uh, is something that we should and must consider. That uh, the uh, safety problems which I've really not touched upon, only to refer to some experience we've had, seems to indicate that uh, the uh, fission reactors are, in fact, as, as safe as uh, anything that uh, we're likely to experience. 
in our uh, uh, hazard-filled society. Thank you. Don, thank you very much. And I guess we have collected some questions. And I might just open it right away for a question from the floor, since I don't have that uh, list yet. Does somebody uh, have a question they'd like to start off with? Okay, I'll read the first one I have here. This is for Dr. Pulsifer. Why does coal have a higher sulfur content than oil when both are fossil fuels? Well, I think we'd need a geologist probably to answer that question, but it's the environment under which it was formed. Uh, coal is formed from uh, vegetable-like material or vegetable material, and uh, I believe the sulfur was carried in by the waters that uh, surrounded it. Oil comes from uh, animal material which was trapped under the seas. and. I think it's just the, the place where the coal was formed uh, leads to this higher sulfur content. Hey, Dr. Seidels, I have a question for you. Could you comment on the possibility of using a thermal conversion hydrogen nuclear reactor cycle as a means of increasing our efficiency and use of solar fuel? Uh, yeah, yes, the, the, there are a number of combinations of chemical reactions which are considered at the moment which would be compatible, which, would, which, which could be carried out under the, essentially the maximum temperature that is available in, in reactor technology today. Um, th these are very complex reactions. They involve corrosive materials. This, uh, I have not seen a good time projection on when this could come about, but certainly it would, the efficiency is expected to be higher than the 30 percent or 33 percent that one's now experiencing when, with the generation of electricity. Thank you. Dr. Roberts, is the cost of enriching uranium fuel truly reflected in the price charged to the utility or to the government, or do government subsidies give the price an unfair advantage? Uh, I think this, this question crops up fairly frequently, and I guess it uh, can be expressed in a different way. Are we taking the electrical energy from TVA and putting it into uh, small pellets and carrying it somewhere around the country and, uh, and uh, <laughs> then uh, re-releasing it? Uh, I think the answer to that is that uh, the, the numbers we see today, including the enrichment, does in fact represent the cost. Um, whether the original capital cost, the production of uh, the diffusion plants is actually factored in in some way, I really don't know. I suspect uh, they've probably been written off as uh, an expense that is charged up to uh, military operations in World War II. Dr. Seidels, what about the local meteorological effects of a 10,000 megawatt column of microwave energy? What would happen to a plane or a bird blundering into the column? <laughs> No, it's, it's a very good and legitimate question. The radiation intensity in the es essentially five kilometer diameter receiving antenna, the, the, the microwave energy in, in the area immediately above the antenna is something like uh, 15 times the solar radiation. So a bird flying through is not expected to experience uh, any any if he does it only once or twice, he doesn't circle for days, he's not expected to experience any real problem. Of course, these would be areas which, where people would be restrained from spending a lot of time in. It's the best answer I can give. Yeah, I've heard other estimates that they'd be instantly fried, and airplanes also. So. Uh, I think you calculate, you spread the 10 megawatts over that, that area, and that won't be so. Or 10,000 megawatts, I'm sorry. I've got a question for myself here. Uh, <laughs> what are the difficulties with solar and wind generation that you mentioned? And then the, another question that impinges on this one. What about the extensive visual pollution resulting from extensive use of windmills? And also aircraft safety problems. <laughs> yeah. well, I'll give you an interesting anecdote about that. Uh, we've been working with a large uh, aerospace industry in our state, 
who was quite interested in the windmill uh, business because they do manufacture airfoils and know a great deal about it. NASA is uh, getting involved in this program and uh, providing large amounts of money. For example, there's an RFP request for bid coming out from uh, NASA shortly for a 240-foot rotor, which would be uh, necessary for a one megawatt generator. The uh, bid will have a top value, we believe, of uh, $350,000 for the rotor alone. That's just the propeller. And uh, our uh, aircraft company says that uh, that's probably one-third of what it's going to cost to build it. To obtain some funding for this, then above and beyond uh, what is available from government agencies, uh, these people have uh, talked to uh, several foreign sponsors, possible foreign sponsors. We thought we might get a better reception in Europe than we've gotten here. And this particular gentleman uh, visited uh, with uh, people in Great Britain concerning this problem. And uh, when he went to see this uh, man who was chairman of uh, the General Electric Board of Great Britain, that has no relationship to uh, General Electric. That's the governing board deciding on electrical power. It's a publicly owned uh, uh, situation. All power in Great Britain is publicly operated. He pulled out a chart and he said, uh, you're from McDonnell Douglas, aren't you? And he said, yes. And he said, well, let's see, you're the last of the biggies to call on me. And all the rest <laughs> of you guys have been over here with windmills. <laughs> he said, frankly, we're not interested in windmills. Uh, if uh, we were faced with a, a future dive bombing attack, uh, we felt they might be useful as a protection for other facilities, but other than that, uh, <laughs> we're not interested. Because we're talking about, for a 10 megawatt unit, a windmill with a, a rotor blade 540 feet in diameter. I mentioned this uh, to somebody in St. Louis last, uh, yesterday, and they said, yeah, that would just fit under the arch <laughs> and fill up that <laughs> unused space. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the real problems we're running into, uh, is the visual problem. Uh, if you talk about, uh, and our pitch has been mainly to look at these units for uh, uh, sub-developments or for individual homes, we're talking about rotors that would supply an average house of about uh, uh, 6 to 12 feet, depending on how big a load you want to carry that house. If you're the average householder and you're talking about uh, uh, averaging 3 or 4 kilowatts, uh, about a six to seven foot rotor would handle the problem. But we've run into considerable opposition even for those. You know, they say, my God, we already got TV antennas in our neighborhood. We want, don't want those ugly things around. So there is a significant uh, visual problem that must be overcome, and we think that can be done to some extent by proper design, integrating these things into the, into the area. It's uh, un unlikely you can integrate it into the average house because uh, uh, you can't just mount a windmill on a roof and have it work properly. It must be located properly with respect to the surrounding hills and terrain uh, and so on. And it's not an easy problem. So there are ex extreme problems with uh, using uh, wind energy. It's readily available. And it has been for a long, very long time. If you want to buy a wind generator, you can go out and buy one off the shelf. And you have been able to do that for 60 years. But the extensive problems, noise with these things is a tremendous problem. They're very noisy. <coughs> Anybody who's from a farm background and had a windmill knows what the pr that problem is. And also, wind variability is a very great problem. If the wind uh, is blowing at 8 miles an hour and just increases to 10, you can almost double the output of this device. But the wear and tear on the device goes up at the same rate. And there are extreme mechanical problems with them that have to be overcome. So we are at the threshold of this work. And uh, we're talking about you know 10 or 15 years before you really have a device that I think most people would like. Okay, Dr. Pulsifer, although cattle byproducts are pretty much used in some underdeveloped countries, they are not, they are now shifting to coal or petroleum products. Because to burn cattle byproducts is considered as primitive and very valuable fertilizer. Do you consider <coughs> seriously the attempts to burn cattle byproducts in this country? Why don't we use wood instead of wasting it? Okay, I guess this is a, a two-part question. I'm sorry uh, Professor Smith isn't here to comment on this. Uh, 
the uh, byproducts from uh, agriculture, uh, of course, not only the uh, animal byproducts, but some of the vegetable byproducts. Uh, indeed, they do serve as a fertilizer. Uh, I would think the vegetable by byproducts uh, might have some use as solar energy or wind energy would in uh, a local area, maybe for an individual farmer. Uh, it seems to me that perhaps uh, large-scale uses of those for energy generation are not quite so viable, perhaps. I don't know whether uh, the use of uh, cattle byproducts is uh, serious or not. Uh, if you look at the amount of cattle byproducts, you can't meet a large part of our energy demand. So you're really talking about, uh, I believe, 10 or 15 percent of our energy demand, uh, even if you use not only cattle byproducts but other byproducts. So you're talking about a small amount. And so it might be serious in some, some respects, but uh, I think not as a large-scale generation. People are talking about, uh, about wood for energy generation. Again, uh, I wouldn't want to try to pass myself off as an expert. Uh, as a consumer, I always worry about the use of wood because uh, it seems to be in short supply to build homes. And so <coughs> why are we going to use it for energy generation? But there are people that are certainly looking at the possibility of growing a vegetable product, a wood product, uh, finding something that would be a, a weed tree or a re weed material that uh, could be grown and could be used for fuel generation. And I think you can see, again, I'm not something I've studied carefully. I think you can see the advantages and disadvantages. And, and this certainly has been proposed. Uh, whether that will be treated seriously, I don't know. Could I comment on that? The, 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 the studies show that, that, that any plant is not going to convert better than 5 percent of the solar energy to a useful product. And it's so dilute that just the transportation cost into the plant becomes a serious charge. The Iowa farm crops are utilizing less than 1 percent of the solar energy. This, this to me, is just not a, a, an approach that we ought to, we ought, that, that's as good as some of the others that we have. I've heard it suggested that we could take uh, grains and convert them to uh, ethanol and then burn that. Uh, and I think if you make the calculation, <laughs> yeah, there's better uses for it possibly. Uh, if you just make the calculation on the uh, amount of fertilizer in the United States that goes into raising our grain crops and look at the energy content of that fertilizer, it's much higher than any of the energy you can get out by a factor of 10, I believe, the total energy available in the grain. So it looks like you'd be missing the boat. Why not use it directly to begin with and instead of going intermediate to fertilizer, getting some energy from the sun, but largely wasting the, the overall energy that was available. We're running out of time. Well, that's unfortunate. We have many good questions left. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.